welcome everyone. My name is um, Marc Andre Pigeon, and I am the director of the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives. Uh, before we begin today's conversation, I want to acknowledge that we're coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional land of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Métis. Now, this today's land acknowledgement is, is particularly relevant because our conversation today is the first one we're branding as a co-op conversation instead of a brown bag conversation. And we made the decision to change our name, the, the name for this event, because last month's speaker, an Indigenous woman named Tanya Taranjo, gently and, and humorously pointed out that the term brown bag could be misconstrued as derogatory. Um, it also just so happens that because we try to reach a national audience, not everyone's going to be sitting in on this event during the lunch hour. So decision made a lot of sense on many levels. Now, our, our land acknowledgement is also important because we, of course, value our relationship with Indigenous communities. And when you value a relationship, you invest in it in a simple way like this one of uh, changing the name. Um, but that, that, that idea of investing is in some sense what today's talk is all about. To the people who work at cooperatives and credit unions, invest in their employers by using their services. Uh, and or do they also invest and use the services of other cooperatives? Um, presumably they, they might or they should because they have an affinity or a sense of belonging and responsibility towards their, their cooperative employer and maybe the larger cooperative sector. So that's, that's in a sense what we, we're going to talk about today. Um, before we hear from, from our speaker, Stan Yu, a bit of a word on our, our newly branded co-op conversation series. Um, over the next 15, 20 minutes, Stan's going to share some findings from our pilot study. Then Stan and I are going to have a small, short conversation, and then we're going to do a breakout where we're going to we're going to play with these ideas that Stan is going to share with us and have a conversation. Then we'll regroup, wrap up, and bid you farewell. So, um, if anyone is experiencing technical difficulties while we, we engage in this conversation, you can message Natalie um, Calio. Nat Natalie, can you please wave, to folks? And I'm going to trust you're waving, Natalie. I don't see you. I have my script in front of me. Um, Natalie will be able to help you um, in those challenges. So the other thing to note, finally, is that we're recording this session. Um, and we're going to share the link out with everyone who registered for the event. And then all of that's going to be emailed to you after today's talk. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to my colleague and friend, Stan Yu. As many of you know, Stan is the Research and Communication Coordinator at the Center here at University of Saskatchewan. Uh, prior to joining the, the center, Stan held research and program evaluation positions at the University of Saskatchewan and beyond. And he has this overriding interest and passion for the idea of you know, taking research and data and using that to inform decision-making for cooperatives in the nonprofit sector. Now, I know Stan, not just from our work context, but he's in, in a sense, my boss. Uh, because he's the co-founder and still a member of the board of Bridge City Bicycle Cooperative. It's an amazing space that rehabilitates bicycles um, for the citizens of Saskatoon. And Stan also serves as the center's representative on the Saskatchewan Co-op Association. And the last thing I'll say about Stan is that everyone who knows him loves him. He's just that kind of person. So uh, now I'm going to give you a bit of a flavor. I've already given you a bit of a flavor of what Stan's going to talk about, but I want to give you the origin story, and then that's going to set up Stan to, to do his talk. So about two years ago, I was supervising a St. Mary's University student who worked for a very large credit union. And the student was kind of interested in researching how credit unions were adapting or not adapting to the digital wave that's shaping so much of our lives. And in passing, in one of our conversations, he, he said to me, you know, uh, neither myself nor any of my colleagues do much of our banking with the credit union that employs us. And these were all like millennials. They were in their late 20s, early 30s, techie people. Um, instead, what they did was they'd get their pay transferred to the, you know, the credit union would deposit their check, their salary into their credit union account. And then they would flow the money to a bank, <laughs> which is where they had their primary banking relationship. Now, someone who studies and, and cares about the cooperative sector, I was a bit dismayed, but also I wasn't shocked. Um, I've run into this kind of story a lot over my career. Um, and um, still the researcher me thought, well, you know, this is anecdotal. I've had these other, my own personal experiences with this. How, how widespread is this phenomenon? Do we see this happening more generally? And why is it happening? So 
After talking it over with Stan and knowing his kind of research interest, um, we agreed that Stan would lead this work on the basis of a pilot study. And if we found something interesting, we'd hopefully roll it out to, to a kind of big nationwide survey. So with that out of the way, I'm gonna pass it over to Stan. He's gonna share the results of our pilot study and Stan, over to you. Thank you, Mark andre for the very warm welcome. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all uh, and have an opportunity uh, for me to share with you uh, the results of this pilot study, which has been in uh, me and Mark andres brains for the last almost two years now. And it's been one of the um, more consistent uh, topics of interest anytime uh, I talk to my friends and family over uh, coffee or, or, or breakfast or supper or what have you during our gatherings. Um, I'll just quickly add to you from my perspective, uh, I came at this uh, from an opposite uh, view in that one of our other surveys that we launch annually here at the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives is a top co-op issue survey where we survey leaders um, of the cooperative sector in Canada, including board chairs, uh, CEOs, EDs, uh, asking them what is the top challenge uh, facing the sector each year. And for the past four years, uh, we've seen consistently that awareness, um, awareness of cooperatives uh, has been the top challenge uh, and it's not even close, the results aren't even close. And so um, during within the, the qualitative comments, um, the leaders typically say there needs to be more awareness amongst youth, amongst the amongst government, amongst the public. Um, one gap I noticed was there wasn't a lot of conversation about employees. So my hypothesis was, uh, and my curiosity was whether cooperative employees uh, serve as champions and ambassadors uh, for the sector uh, and are you know catalysts for generating awareness. Or um, do we see what Marc Andre has has observed during his conversations with with others, and that is, you know, uh, cooperative employees are also, um, you know, not part of the problem per se, but they also don't actively uh, promote the sector by via their shopping and and consuming behaviors. Um, so what we did over the past uh, year was we launched a pilot survey. And the pilot survey was developed um, via a literature review, as well as you know questions that we had um, from our observations and conversations. We compiled it into a survey um, to see if uh, this would help to uh, address some of the questions that we had and what are some of the interesting findings that would emerge. Um, we found uh, three cooperatives uh, based in Saskatchewan that generously participated in the survey and had uh, their employees participate, uh, including one retail cooperative, one telecommunications cooperative, and one insurance and financial services cooperative. We launched the survey, and depending on which organization you're a part of, um, they launched at different points uh, in time, but essentially the survey was live between December of 2021 and March of 2022. Uh, we received 359 employees um, who responded to the survey. So the first slide here uh, are some of the findings of the survey itself. Uh, here are some examples of the uh, categories of goods and services we asked um, respondents to rate in terms of how often they uh, shop for these goods and services at a cooperative, um, including gasoline, groceries, uh, TV and internet services. Um, Below, in the event that you can't see what the uh, bars mean, uh, the green is none, blue very little, maroon is some, purple is most, and gray is all. Um, for the first category, as an example, we can see that about 43% of the 359 respondents reported that they purchased gasoline and diesel from a co-op uh, most or some of the time, and then here you see 31% some of the time, 25% uh, uh, either very little to none at all. Um, when we look at groceries, there's a bit of a difference here. Almost 50% of respondents sta stated that they purchase groceries from a co-op some of the time. And then uh, when we look at uh, TV and internet services, 63% um, 
um, said that they did not buy any uh, TV and internet services from a co-op. Uh, I should mention that interestingly, 90% uh, of that uh, cooperative's employees did purchase their services from their co-op. Uh, so an interesting discrepancy here. Uh, I should mention uh, uh, in terms of um, the, from a statistics uh, perspective, um, all of these findings that you see here are, we removed the employees from that organization uh, for each of the categories. So in that retail co-op, um, the groceries does not include their employees. It's just all of the other employees from the other two participating organizations um, where we present the results. Gives us a bit more of a uh, realistic view because as we look to the um, next slide here, we also asked about uh, banking behaviors of employees. Um, while we asked employees do they have a bank account with a credit union, uh, one of the big five banks or other? Uh, we also further probed and asked, which is their primary bank? Uh, and we think that that forces respondents uh, to choose, um, you know, where their affinities lie. And we found here that 68% um, of respondents primarily bank with one of the big five banks, 26% uh, bank with a credit union. This is also an interesting um, comparator because uh, none of our participating organizations was a credit union. So this kind of gives us, a, you know, everyone here has an objective view of, of their, um, their shopping behaviors here. So next, what we did was we compiled all of that data and parsed it into two categories. The extent to which employees supported their own co-op um, by shopping um, and, and consuming their goods and services, and to what extent do they shop at other co-ops. And we found a pretty interesting split here, where 65% of respondents reported that they shop at their own co-op most or all of the time. And that's on the left there. Uh, meanwhile, the majority of respondents said that they they shopped at other co-ops uh, either some of the time, as you see in the maroon bar, 44%, uh, or you would go down a bit more to uh, less than some of the time. And here you see 38% uh, were fell into that category and 18% of respondents uh, said that they shopped at other co-ops uh, for their goods and services uh, most or all of the time. Uh, we provided some examples, uh, including uh, gas um, groceries, as well as TV and internet services. Uh, the other examples that we didn't list uh, would be home, garden, and agricultural products, uh, as well as uh, the finance and insurance. And with those two examples, we found that two um, employees typically supported their uh, by supported them by purchasing their services less than some of the time. So this finding of supporting one's own co op uh, being quite pronounced in this uh, pilot survey uh, led us to another uh, analysis because it caught our eye. Um, we asked two more questions uh, in the survey about the importance of working for a co-op um, and we did it we asked them uh, this question twice in terms of how important was it that you're working at a co-op when you first started uh, in your organization and the importance of working um, for a co-op at the time of the survey so the results uh, that we found from the survey are, are also um, continue to be quite interesting, where we find that about 50% of employees uh, were ambivalent about working for a cooperative when they first started, um, and meaning that it was neither important nor unimportant that they worked for a co-op. 28% uh, said that it was unimportant or very unimportant. Um, at the time of the survey, we found that 68% uh, said that it was 
either important or very important that where they were working at a co-op and only 25% uh, was ambivalent, even less so um, for folks that said that it was unimportant or very unimportant. So some of our initial observations so far that based on this pilot survey is that there appears to be some support that cooperative employees shop at their own co-op, um, whereas with regards to whether it creates a ripple effect um, to support the sector as a whole, uh, we find that uh, there's uh, unfortunately less of that. However, um, the attitudes towards shopping at other co-ops ex um, exhibited by employees is not one that's unsupportive, but really appears to be one of ambivalence. Uh, a lot of middle ground here, uh, in addition to asking about shopping behaviors, we also asked about um, their level of importance that's placed on supporting other co-ops. And really, uh, we find that the vast majority of employees are somewhere in that neither unimportant or important type of realm. Um, we see that as it being one of opportunity, and we can talk a bit more about what that opportunity is um, in a second here. We also found through the survey that co-ops have found success in helping employees to recognize the importance of working at a co-op. Uh, and lastly, um, this is one um, point where we're still working on right now with regards to further analyses, and that is the role of employee incentive programs likely play a role in some of these uh, findings. Um, so far, uh, we have found that at least uh, two of the organizations um, we surveyed have internal um, employee incentive programs. Uh, we're going to delve into that a bit more uh, in the in-depth analyses, uh, but certainly we want to identify that point as something that uh, might return as an important factor. So those are our initial thoughts about the survey. Um, would love to hear what uh, you have uh, your, your thoughts are on, on our findings. I, I'll go back to my um, questions and uh, contact page uh, in a second. Uh, I'll just mention in terms of our aspirations uh, for the study right now, we are looking at what factors help to explain why employees shop or don't shop at cooperatives, uh, whether demographics uh, play a role here, whether uh, pre-existing familiarity with cooperatives um, play a role here. So are we, is there a self-selection bias based on um, whether you were a co-op uh, champion um, to begin with or not? Uh, and how does that attitude affect behavior? Um, that uh, age old conundrum, uh, we're gonna try to delve into that as it relates to uh, this uh, project. And then uh, our hope is really to improve on uh, the survey uh, you saw in the uh, banking slide there, I had parsed out uh, banking uh, as its own um, type of category. And it didn't, the, the question I asked was not consistent with the other categories of, you know, do you shop at a bank? None, very little, some of the time, most of the time, all of the time. Uh, immediately after I, I realized that was a, a mistake and I'm hoping to uh, add banking into that uh, general pool later, as well as other categories that um, may be more pronounced uh, in other provinces as opposed to just Saskatchewan. Um, for instance, uh, we don't have any outdoor gear cooperative uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, whereas other um, provinces might, or there might be other areas that we're missing as well. Uh, so we're hoping to have a more holistic view for if we uh, expand the study, uh, which we're hoping to do uh, to add more organizations in 2023. So with that, I will go back to my uh, uh, contact page here. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, like I said, I have been passionate about this question for the last year and a half to two years. Uh, it, now that it's out of my brain, I look forward to uh, receiving any comments that you have so that we can have conversations about it. Uh, and I, I look forward to um, any and all comments. So thank you very much uh, for your time. Mark andre I'll pass it back to you. Great. Thank you, Stan. So, so this is the part of the, the event where we have a bit of time to chat, Stan and I. Then we're going to open it back up to all of you in a breakout conversation. So I think I think you probably all have some views on this. 
Um, but while I have a few minutes of time with Stan, I, Stan, I want to and thank you again. It was I think there's some really great findings here. What do you what do you think accounts for the difference in how often people shop for goods like gasoline, diesel at a cooperative versus groceries or banking? Like, what's what do you think is going on there? Uh, why are people buying you know tending to buy diesel, gasoline at a co-op relative to these other goods? Uh, thank you, Mark Andre. You know. <laughs> We didn't ask the question why on the survey, and so certainly uh, these um, any explanations that I have is assumptions and, and kind of postulations on, on my end. But I do wonder uh, if I have, I have two thoughts. Uh, number one, I, I do recognize that um, you know gas cooperative gas stations uh, in Saskatchewan are pretty ubiquitous um, that you you see one it's it, they, they've done a very good job of having a co op gas station in uh, you know most rural areas in an urban center, you see one in almost every neighborhood, um, so I think that ubiquitousness um, certainly uh, helps to uh, put co op uh, you know purchasing gas and diesel at a cooperative uh, front and center. I also think that the um, co-op gas stations have done a pretty remarkable job in terms of separating their gas stations from you know, other multinational gas stations. Um, the good fuel day uh, just concluded uh, in uh, for in, in Canada and the notion of a good fuel day where parts of the proceeds of that day uh, with your purchase uh, goes towards supporting local nonprofits and charities. Um, it, the, the campaign uh, gets quite a bit of attention. Uh, and uh, anytime you're at a gas station, you see um, that mission front and center. Um, so I think that that uh, centering it within uh, the local uh, supporting local really is pronounced um, for co-op gas stations. And I do wonder if there's a, you know, that paired with the fact that um, pricing for gas is pretty standard um, between, you know, IOFs and, and co-ops. Um, if you were, if all of that was standardized and you had a choice uh, between supporting local, supporting nonprofits, and just paying the same for gas at another gas station, uh, whether that sways the moral argument uh, in addition to um, the convenience argument. Right, oh, that's, that's great. I think there's something there for sure. Um, now, what about the, uh, the participating co-ops? We had three co-ops, very different in terms of their orientation, but what about the employees of those organizations? Do you have any sense of um, you know, what their shopping behavior looked like and how they were different? Mm -hmm. um, you know, surprisingly similar. Uh, all three organizations, um, as you saw in the findings, exhibited uh, pretty supportive behaviors for shopping at their own co-op. Uh, with regards to the other categories of goods and services, um, I found more similarities than differences. Uh, for instance, uh, gas and diesel for all three organizations um, kind of came out as the most likely, as one the one that employees are most likely to support. Uh, groceries are some of the time, um, and then the rest uh, are some to less than some. Um, it was definitely a surprising finding that there were more similarities than differences. Um, I'm, the researcher in me hopes that there's something bigger going on here and that there are other factors that maybe, uh, you know, permeate uh, you know, an employee, regardless of which cooperative uh, you work for. But again, I have to uh, acknowledge that this is a pilot study and it could be, uh, th this context could be different uh, if we were surveying more organizations or organizations uh, in different geographies. Great, thank you, Stan. So folks, this is, uh, this is the end of the conversation between Stan and I and, and Stan's presentation. Now we're gonna do the, the breakout conversations. Don't run away. And we're gonna we're gonna break you up for about fifteen minutes. Uh, Natalie's gonna do that, um, or Stan might have to help if if that doesn't work. But we're gonna break you out, and then we're gonna come back and have a kind of plenary conversation. And and in this breakout conversation, we want to hear more from you. Some conversations happening in chat, and that is great. And I think we're gonna come back to those points um, when we come back as a group. Uh, but for now, we're gonna shift gears and get everyone in these groups. And this is an opportunity for you to socialize, introduce yourself, you know, get to know people in the sector, 
Um, so as you come together in these groups, maybe share who you are. If you don't already know each other, share who you are, where you're from, who you work for, where you study, what brought you here today. Um, and then uh, we're going to ask you to have a conversation about Stan's question. So I guess the question for the breakout, apart from just getting to know each other, is are you surprised by these findings? What do you think you would find if you, if you work at a co-op? What do you think you would find at your own co-op and why? So I guess that's where we want you to kind of play in that space. Um, and then, of course, we welcome, as Stan said, um, feedback on what we're doing. And if there's anyone interested in partaking in a nation, nationwide survey, um, we also would love to know that, too. So Natalie, I'm going to ask you to break everyone out if, if we can. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give, I think the, uh, the time is up, right, Natalie? So everyone's back. Excellent. So uh, now we're just going to open it up. I, I saw a conversation that uh, I think, uh, I think um, Dion had kind of initiated. And let's go there, Dion. You, you, if you're still around. Are you still around, Dion? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Do you want to just ask your, or make your point, Dion, in, in verbally? Well, we were talking about this in our group, too, that this question about like th this hygiene factor, right? Like all else equal. So if co-op is the same price, um, you know, what, you know, is it uh, like, for instance, for the, the gas stations, I mean, the, the price of gas is the same. They have the full serve, they have the convenience, you get money back if you're a member for patronage refunds. So to what extent is that um, um, driving it relative to the sort of social and community values? And I thought Sheldon actually had an interesting design idea for how to get at that, right, is if you compare um, you, you could do some comparisons of employees with the broader market um, and, and see how much of their purchases are coming through the co-op. Um, so but trying to kind of sort out that, like what's driving people. And I think there's probably going to be different reasons for different people in our group. Some people we're talking about people who are lower income, those kinds of hygiene factors or price points might matter more. Um, so anyways, just some thoughts around um, yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really hard to control for all of that. Like, uh, you know, without making the survey really painful. <laughs> so, um, you know, one one thing, if I can, just from our group, um, and uh, this was, I thought, a really interesting point uh, from Anne at uh, Coast Capital was, um, if you don't mind me sharing, Anne, uh, you, Anne, Coast is, I think you, have you achieved your B Corp certification or is it in the process of, oh, you've achieved it. So Anne was saying that um, as part of a B Corp entity so you achieve this certification it's a bit like a fair trade certification except in in other businesses and for different reasons um, but they will help you network with other b corp entities so you buy their your your when you're doing procurement you think of their products or their services right i think i've got that right Anne. have i right yeah i was just saying that b, you know credit where credit is due b, b corp is quite good at um marketing other b corps to b corps and so um it, it, they make it very easy for you to network with um other companies in your area that are certified so if you're buying coffee for a meeting or something like that or or even a, a larger procurement initiative um it's just they just kind of make it easy for you and i don't know that the co-op sector uh is is as is, is as good and so you may not know what who your fellow co-ops are in, in in the neighborhood things like that so i just wanted to make that point yeah i think it's a really interesting point and i don't you know i don't know who would do that in the co-op sector other than the apex organizations right the, the co-op associations or the um that would be the natural place to look i would think um but it's it's an interesting i think a really interesting dimension any other comments or questions i i see i see one from esther uh, where did it go, Esther? I'm going to just try and track you down here. Um, so Esther says, I'm really interested in the next phase of the research. And Esther's microphone's not working, so that's why I'm going to read this one. Um, particularly why credit union employees would still have to open other accounts with the big banks. Um, so I, just a clarification, Esther, they don't have to open accounts with other with other entities, but they choose to uh, in many cases. So it's a, you know the question is why. Um, and I guess I thought consumers are always the ones with shopping for accessibility convenience pricing but as an employee i think the probability that that probably defeats the logic of credit use reform yeah fair point uh, i think that's kind of the the impetus for some of this um let's see who else i think i know dion i i saw sheldon you you had a comment sheldon i think did dion capture that in her comments sheldon 
Or did you? Yeah, want to I, I, for the most part, I was just. It, it's interesting because we will know the market share that we have in fuel very specifically, quite specifically, because uh, there's data who's who what percentage of the market. So it, it'd be just interesting not to add to the complexity of the questions you're asking, but just to see where uh, employees of co-ops and credit unions stand vis-a-vis um, -vis the market share. Like, are they are they more or less than? Right. Like, so if we have if we have 38% of the market share, are yes. they purchasing or are we getting 38% of our employees or not? Right. Um, and yeah, the same thing with food. That's a really good point, Sheldon. I actually, in the preamble, before we came on, I was selling this stand. I, you know, we always used to say when I was in the credit union sector that Saskatchewan credit unions had 50% of the market. Um, but then, you know, our survey results show that um, amongst co-op employees in those three co-ops, they only had 26%, <laughs> you know, so there's some discrepancy there that is interesting and, and may either call into question their 50% number or make us think hard about what's going on there, that those are co-ops. Yeah, but I, I love that point. And I think that wouldn't be too hard to do, I think. That would be manageable. So I see Dave had a question. What's a B Corp? And Anne was uh, responding there. It's a private certification system. It's interestingly, we had a talk with um, Reimer. Uh, what was his first name, Stan? David, Brian? Brendan. Brendan, Brendan Reimer from Assiniboine Credit Union about a year and a bit ago. Um, they were one of the first credit unions to get the B Corp certification. So if you want to watch that video, Dave, um, it's got chapter and verse on the B Corp certification. And interestingly, more and more co-ops and credit unions are pursuing it, um, perhaps. And I, I'm kind of curious, Anne, what was your motivation for that? Um, just while we're on the topic, what was the motivation for doing that? Uh, that predates my arrival, so oh, I, I can't uh, tell you. I, I, I think it, it was about aligning with values. I mean, B Corp is right. about doing business responsibly and things like that. Um, yeah, like that's okay. yeah, that that fits with what what Brendan was saying. So um, that, I think that's a large part of it. Um, okay, let's just see here. Stan, do you want to come back? Are you clear of the bells? I think I'm clear of the bells. I still okay. don't know what happened. I'm just glad it didn't happen during the presentation. Um, I was just going to quickly mention uh, the respondents in our survey um, are from an urban center. So I do wonder if that accounts for some of the uh, credit union market share um, question uh, in terms of as we you know continue to say in Saskatchewan that in every um, small town, there is a credit union and a co-op. Um, so I do wonder if, you know, if we factored in uh, rural location that that um, percentage right. would be much higher. And we did it on purpose because we were hoping to uh, design the study so that consumers have choice, co-op employee consumers as consumers have choice, as opposed to uh, perhaps, you know, if you live in Waka, you only have uh, one choice for, for banking and, and shopping. Yeah, no, good point. And I mean, the other thing is, of course, our plan is always to take this, you know, input and adjust and then roll this out kind of on a bigger scale and see where we can end up with this. And related conversation, just to bring this back to, sorry to do this, but to be in and the B Corp, there have been talks over the years. I, I bet you, Sheldon, you've heard of these conversations over time, but people have talked about this idea of, of, um, of affinity point systems that would work within the cooperative sector or otherwise promoting each other's products. Uh, I haven't seen any action on that front, but I know I've heard those conversations. Well, you... well there, I mean, so we, we give 5% cash back uh, for co-op purchases to our employees up to, a, there's a maximum um, uh, to incentivize that. And I know cooperators has a program for our employees that if you get cooperators insurance, uh, I think the benefit is uh, you get one, your first claim is uh, is free, doesn't impact, there's no deductible. Whereas typically it's you get one, you get two if you're an employee, there's some benefit there with right. cooperators. I know we promoted that. So yeah, and I, I was I, I so that that is an important part of this. And then also thinking about extending, this is what the cooperators were talking to us about, is thinking about how you could um, you know, so I'm I'm a cooperator's employee or a co-op employee and and I get rewarded if I shop at the credit union or if I bank with the credit union, not just my employer, but the others. And so you build this network of co-ops that looks a bit like the B Corp thing a bit. Um, I don't know. That, that, that talk's been floating around for a while. Never never really gets off the ground. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, is any anything else here? I'm, I'm trying to catch up with the chat. Um, Candace, I see we discussed in our group that credit union employees may want to focus on investments because saving interest rates are low. Can you elaborate, Candace? What, what do you think the people may be looking at their banking options elsewhere because they can get a higher return? Is that what you're thinking? 
Well, basically, you know, they're becoming more savvy. They want options and they're moving from savings to investments. I was saying to my group that in the Canadian context, I'm not sure how that is, but definitely, you know, with developing countries, what we found with our employees that they wanted, you know, greater return on their money. And most of them did not want to keep their money in the credit union. They wanted mm -hmm. um, to buy stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a booming um, stock market as well. So yeah. you found, especially the millennials, this was true with them as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, I think in most well not certainly not all but many of the mid to bigger credit unions certainly Coast would have wealth management offerings you know that you can get through their services you don't have to go somewhere else for that uh, and and brokerage services and all that stuff you can you could obtain I think you know just going back to the story I was telling about that person who worked at a large credit union I think their frustration was around the um, digital platforms. <laughs> they felt like the the digital platforms of this particular credit union were not where they needed to be in terms of ease of use and kind of slickness that they were accustomed to as young people younger people they're used to this kind of very frictionless uh, banking experience or other experiences and when they kind of found themselves on these legacy credit union systems they they would get frustrated and <laughs> and, uh, and would lose them loyalty. Um, and and they're on the wealth management side, I do remember them saying they thought they could get lower fee services elsewhere too. So there, there is that commodification of the business that is playing into that as well, I suspect. Um, okay, so I see uh, Kirsten as well. Kirsten's coming in from Ontario. We don't have any branding with a co-op label. And I think that's, well, apart from the co-op brand in, in Western Canada, I think that's true generally. Um, and it's hard to be aware of the availability of cooperative products. Uh, so yeah, that is a challenge. Um, now that maybe Sheldon, because you're on the call, that brand, who own, you, do you folks own that brand, that co-op, the Shield brand? Yeah, F FCL, um, it used to be uh, shared um, with, a, with a corporation with us and, and Co-op Federee and Co-op Atlantic. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and Co-op Federee, uh, Corp Atlantic went into receivership uh, CCAA and and um, and then um, and they don't use it and neither does Corp Federee and so we are now the owners of it. Uh, okay. FCL owns that co-op for goods. So let me uh, explain why it's on taxi cab because that's a service. So trademarks are broken down into goods and you can have a trademark for services. So we do not own it for services. That's why you'll see it on a co-op taxi cab. Okay. We have it for goods. So you'll only see it on our, our stores and uh, where we sell goods. Okay, neat. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, folks. So I think if there's any one last comment or thought uh, to share, otherwise we'll wrap up. Um, but I, I do, we do have four minutes. So if people have a, a thought or comment they wanna share, please just, uh, Dion, go ahead. And yeah, I just wanted to say that it would really be interesting. I know you can't ask all these questions on the survey. It becomes too long and complex, but there might be ways to work with some of the cooperatives that are collecting. Uh, many of them are collecting the data on their employee members, their um, um, their uh, the, the members who are not employees, right? And the and and on all of their purchases, and and there might be ways. They they also have information. Um, sort of a lot of demographic information on their employees. Right. And so there could be ways if if there was some agreements that could be made, right, that we could go and do <laughs> research internal to some of these organizations that you could triangulate and I think get more detailed kinds of analyses done. So just a thought. Yeah. I, no, it was, I think it's a really great study. Yeah, no, it's there's some, that's great, great. Thank you, Dion. And I think we'll, we'll be sharing a survey with you uh, for feedback <laughs> to, to pick your brain. Um, well, listen, folks, it's just about time. I like to end this thing on time, or if not a little early, um, free up uh, your afternoon. Thank you so much for partake, partaking in this. Thank you, Stan, for the work and sharing. Uh, great job. And uh, look forward to seeing you at our next co-op conversation in November. Speaker to be announced. <laughs> TBD. Uh, take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>